Uh, first and foremost, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I know everybody's got young families or possibly a young family, so we're going to go through the basics and the kind of the, the meat and uh, potatoes, all this, and then we'll get you out of here and, and we'll get to all your questions at the end. I don't think we can hear any of the people that are on. So if you have a question, and there's no stupid question with this, that's one of my favorite things is ask stupid questions at the end of lectures or webinars. So any question, you know, just put in the box and I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. So again, my name is Justin Ross. I currently live in Des Moines, Iowa. I have a practice here. Um, first off, so you guys can understand me, and some of our terms in Iowa are a little different than what you may be used to. So just kind of start out with this. So if there's any questions on these, I'll be happy to answer these as well. So <clears throat> with Star Wars kind of being first and foremost and having a three and a six year at home, uh, it's kind of it's important to me with Star Wars right now. So Historically, implants have been the dark side. Implants don't work in the great toe. All first metatarsal phalangeal joint implants loosen. Uh, they're extremely difficult to salvage. A lot of implants have failed. Um, I was trained by uh, somebody who was trained by Gerard Yu, Dr. Yu, and, and you know he was not a proponent of implants. He was a big fusion guy, so uh, he's probably rolling his grave listening to me talk like this, being down the down the line. So historically, implants have failed, and we all know why, and we're going to go into that a little bit. Uh, so the implants were then removed, and then they were fused. So a lot of the older docs, and I'm a younger doc, so I have the new mentality is that, you know, we fuse these things. We don't put implants in this because they don't work. So one of the main things with this lecture today is that there is a new solution, and, you know, even though you may be tired of taking them out, uh, we're going to kind of go into what you may be able to do to augment something that's already in there, uh, taking an implant out, maybe putting another implant back in before you talk about fusion. So with that, let's keep moving here. Just a slide showing normal function, hallux luminous and hallux rigidus. I'm not going to go into this, but um, it kind of really, you know, it's, it's a good depiction of what that dorsal surface does, and especially on that phalangeal base where there's a lot of impingement, and that's a lot of your pain is coming from. Um, and so when you choose your implants, which we're going to see kind of some of the sh sizes and shapes and why our implants of uh, yesterday have failed and why the implants of tomorrow, specifically the arthrosurface, surface, is going to be a good addition to your back table. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so hemi implants. So every implant on the screen, other than the top right, um, I put I put in every implant on the screen basically, and I pulled out every implant on the screen except the top right one. Um, I have yet to pull out an arthrosurface uh, hemi implant, and that's not because I you know, I'm lecturing about it today, but that's just the honest to god truth. I've taken every single one of these other ones out, and you can see a big difference with just the hemi side of it is that all these implants are stemmed. The vilex are there are threads, but the, the thread pitch is so small and it's not tapered that. If you have anybody with a cystic head or anybody with any type of age, you know that's going to piston and loosen. So one of the good things about the first and second generation Hemi was that there was that taper post and that it was a really good uh, thread purchase uh, that allowed it to, to survive the last couple of years. So then with that, you know, we kind of evolved like everything else, knees and hips and elbows and shoulders, is that, you know, and ankles is that we need something that we can replace both sides. Um, so there's there's a myriad of different total implants out there. The most common one being the elastic implant, especially the one on the top, you know, kind of middle there with the grommets. Um, I've taken a lot of these out. I've never actually put one in myself. Um, you know, being trained as a fusion, fusion program, we just didn't do that. Um, so I've taken a lot of those elastic implants out. I know for a fact they're still being put in. I don't even know where to get them, to be honest with you. I don't even know what rep in my city or state has these elastic implants, but I know uh, I was just last week I was talking to a doc and he asked, introduced myself, told him I was new to the area and, and told him I was doing an implant. And he goes, oh yeah, I just did a elastic last week. So it almost hit the floor when I heard that. So uh, <clears throat> one of the common things with with this slide shows that Again, everything is stem, and it's all, you know, the painted and, and uh, stem press fit, and it's just everything loosens. One of the big differences is the top left there is that we have the tapered screw fixation. So 
<clears throat> this lecture obviously focuses on the tow motion modular tow system. Um, and so what we don't want to do is get scared. This looks pretty intimidating. Uh, but I will tell you, once you put one of these in, you'll never go back to putting anything else in. And it's, it's actually very, uh, it's a very good feeling when you do something like this because you, you really help the patient and the patient postoperatively, uh, you know, more than likely will give you a hug and sometimes a kiss, but, you know, be careful with that with females. Um, so, you know, looking at this slide, this is a, this is a modular system for a reason. And what's good about the new tray is that you don't have to do a total with this tray. You can do a hemi if you get in there, and we're going to talk about this later on. When, when I see my patients in the office, you know, there's, a, there's three proced actually four procedures I'll consent them for. We start with the chylectomy, um, and it'll be interoperative eyes. So if I see that there's greater than 20% joint destruction, then we'll move to a hemi. If there's base involvement, we'll move to a total. And if there's very, you know, amazing circumstances to where the total doesn't work, then we will obviously do a fusion. Uh, but that patient, you know, goes under anesthesia with, you know, not knowing exactly what's going to be done, but they know everything that could be done. Um, and that's what makes this implantation system really good is because it is a modular toe system. So, you know, if they show up and the base looks great and you've done hemis all your life and you don't want to do a total, then you can still do your hemi. Uh, but always have it in the back table, you know, always have a backup for your backup. Um, so this slide basically just kind of talks about, you know, the three things they're trying to go for with this, the toe motion is the articulation, fixation, the preservation. Um, and it's an inlay arthroplasty, so you, it's anatomic. Um, it's not fully anatomic, so don't misquote me on that. That is a tapered screw and Morse taper interlock, uh, so it, it is rock solid fixation. Um, and it's it's big. It's a nine five, so it's you know it's something that it is going to purchase inside the uh, first metatarsal head. I've never seen one too small that the, the taper post can't fit in. But I and, and Rudy can allude to this. I'm not sure if there's other sizes of that, but I've really never ever used anything than the one they just give me. So, uh, but dual implant curvatures, super smooth surfaces. Uh, that is one thing that um, is really nice when you put the when you put the new implant in and you've got the permanent metatarsal head implant as well as the poly that goes in there. It is completely smooth and we'll talk about that, that you want it to be completely smooth before you uh, sew that up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, again, this is just another slide that shows rock solid fixation. We're not going to go back over that. The design, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know what the 3545, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. I mean, I don't, I, They've explained it to me, and I've listened to millions of lectures on this. I still quite don't get it other than 3.5 is smaller than the 4.5, and 1.5 is smaller than the 2.5. So I think that's really all you need to know. Uh, you always start with the 3.5 because you can always bump up to the 4.5, and you never get burned. You know, you start low, and you can always move up one size. Uh, but there are four different uh, combinations available for that. <clears throat> that is a standardized pitch thread. Uh, so you can do a depth adjustment, adjustment, and we'll talk about that as far as um, countersinking and, and offloading that. <coughs> Excuse me. So reasons for failure. Why, why all the haters out there? And I've got an interesting story, and I hope, I hope the gentleman's not on the line tonight. Uh, but I did a lecture on this and um, spoke to quite a few people about it. It wasn't an Arthur Service sponsored lecture, but it was just talking about fusion versus implants. and and there were some older docs in there and whom I definitely respect and read a lot of their literature, but I, I did hear down the line that this individual uh, later on lectured at a, a bigger symposium, so to speak, and, and kind of still dogged on the fact that implants are, are, are bogue and, and that they're not proven and that they still fail. So I challenge anybody who's listening in that you've always fused and you've never put an implant in just to, just to open your mind and just listen to this lecture. and and you know, try it once um, because your patients are going to be a lot happier. And we'll kind of, we'll, you know, we'll continue to talk about this as we go on. So a lot of the reasons for failure were the material issues. I mean, no one's going to argue that silicone is bad in the bone. It's just horrible. And you can see that X-ray on the right side. Um, you can definitely see where the implant is. I mean, it just looks nasty. I don't know how anybody would like that. Osteolysis, synovitis from the silicone, implant fragmentation. 
when you open these up that some of these patients have been in for 20 years, it just looks like somebody stuck a stick of dynamite in there, um, and it, it's pretty difficult to clean it up. A lot of time, these things will just pop right out. Uh, those are the good ones. So, you know, a lot of being in residency in school, I would say, oh, we have to fuse this. This is a, you know, we're taking a silicone implant out. You know, the that implant's been in. There's no way that those threads are going to purchase on the in the cortices and uh, you can't convert that to a, a total implant, and I challenge you uh, that every single silicone implant that I've taken out, and it, it's been over 20 of them, um, I've never fused one of them yet. So that's not saying that there's not going to be one, uh, but I you know, rose to the challenge and we put implants in. Uh, the good thing is, is that if the surgeon before you who put that elastic implant in, or maybe it was you, did the correct location where the stem was supposed to go, then you save a lot of steps actually putting that implant in and um, the the taper post goes right in, especially the phalangeal base insert, and it just it's it's actually really quick. <clears throat> so more reasons for failure, especially loosening regional anatomy. So know your anatomy, uh, know what your plantar surfaces, your first metatarsal, as well as your phalanx base uh, is. And if you don't use C arm, I mean you're just you're hurting yourself and you're hurting our profession. Put the C arm, and a lot of these will go on and um, and get taken out by you know another surgeon down the road, and and it looks like you didn't even you know you were halfway blindfolded when you put this thing in. So you know use C arm, make sure you know where you're at. If you're not sure, use bigger C arm. Uh, that's the main thing. Um, know your angles, know your plantar surfaces of your of your metatarsals. Obviously things aren't going to be perpendicular to weight bearing surface or bone. You know, some patients have different foot types, so you need to be really careful on, on where you're throwing your wires in. And I've got a couple slides down the road, we'll, we'll kind of go over that too. So uh, patient expectations, that's one of the main probably reasons for failure of a procedure. It's not hard. We're all, we're all really good at what we do. I mean, we've all been trained really well. Um, and the fact that you're on this webinar means that, you know, you like to do surgery and you're probably really good at it. So patient expectations is where we, I think, we fall really flat. Um, I know that was one thing I learned really, was really stressed where I trained, um, is that informed consent. If the patient can't tell you what you're doing when they leave your office, they're not going to remember it the day of surgery, and they're sure as hell not going to remember it after surgery. So, you know, the implant may have not failed physically or the product was great. It's just the patient did not uh, reach their expectations that they wanted because it was your, fa you know, it was your fault it failed. You didn't tell them exactly what was going to happen and, and, you know, possibly what may happen down the line. Pain relief is inadequate. A lot of times we put, a, you know, there's a lot of uh, hemi implants out there that have been put in a long time ago. I know I put my first one in, um, it would have been eight years ago. So, you know, I know that implant's out there somewhere and, it, you know, A, it's still working, or which hopefully that's what the case is. B, it's failed and that it's been converted to a total, which we'll talk about or B or C that it's been taken out and it's probably been fused by another surgeon because they didn't go back to, you know, that original surgeon that put in. And a lot of times what happens is any of those hemi implants on the, on the metatarsal side have started to erode um, that phalangeal base and we'll see some pictures later. And then the motion that they gained was not inadequate, you know, so they, you told them, you know, here you have no motion or you have one degree of motion and I'm going to give you 90 degrees of motion, which, you know, that's what we want to leave on the table with, but that's not what they're going to end up off the table with. So, you know, having realistic expectations, talking about, you know, what we can do to, you know, make them have a, a you know, more active lifestyle. That's the main thing. Where I practice, it's farmers, railroaders, ranchers, and um, they can't have fused toes because they can't get into boots and they can't get into work boots. And if they can't get into boots, they don't work and then they're happy and angry and then they don't like you anymore. So um, the other thing is making sure that, let me go back one slide here. So we talked about the curse of the sesamoids. If, if you've been to a lot of lectures or you've heard a lot of webinars on, on the hemi implant, especially the arthrosurfaces that, you know, we, we try to stay away from the sesamoids and we really didn't understand the sesamoids. And I think a lot of it was is that we weren't getting a proper plantar release of the soft tissue. And so we just blamed it on the soft tissue or blamed it on the sesamoids that we weren't getting the motion at the table. So then we would 
oh, it's 75, that's good enough, and we sewed it up and the, and the patient didn't have a good outcome. Um, so, you know, sesamoids, we do need to pay attention to them. If you can see hypertrophic sesamoids on an x-ray, uh, prior to even taking the surgery, you need to discuss with the patient that, you know, we need to have real expectations. This may fail if you have arthritic sesamoid, sesamoid complex, then, you know, what are the options? And there's a lot of different things out there. I'm not going to go into that today, but, you know, putting grafts over it, graft jacket or amio. Um, you know, I heard last night of just taking the sesamoid out, uh, which, you know, I've done once, and that was because it fractured during the surgery, so we just took it out. Um, and that patient did well, so maybe there's something to, to be said about that. I mean, we, we are going to release the plantar flexor tendon, brevis, so we need the sesamoid. So there's a lot of school of thoughts, and I don't want you to blow up the emails yet on that. So just take that for what it is. That's another lecture. Uh, but I don't think we need to be scared of the sesamoids. I think we're getting really good at the soft tissue release, and especially if you come to a lab, which we'll talk about. Um, there's a lot of good docs out there that are doing really good releases, and that's, that's how I learn. So, you know, I'm just trying to pass it down the line. Um, just showing the fixation, obviously, the screw fixation, bony and growth right there. It's not a stem, so there is bony and growth, uh, so that failure rate's far less. I'm not going to go into why peg and hole is inferior to screw fixation. I think everybody can agree with that. Um, some more terms, just to make sure uh, you guys understand me better out there. So what's what's the back to our Star Wars? With, uh, so what is the life size? So this is the arthrosurface toe motion total implant. So you know if if you're not a rear foot surgeon and you're four foot surgeon, you know this is your sexy total implant, total ankle implant. So you know you're doing total joints too, just like the orthoped orthopods and. And just like the guys that are doing total ankles, so you know you can say that you do total joint replacement too. That's, that's funny. I like to say that, and people sometimes laugh. So you know this is another picture of what it actually looks like on a sawbones. You can see even with the sawbones, you know we tap this, so this you know these threads are legit, and it's tight. It's a Morse taper, cold fusion, whatever you want to call it, uh, but it is tight. So let's kind of go into some case studies, and I'll kind of give you my tidbits. Um, if there's any, I can't see the questions right now, but if there's any questions, um, I like to ask questions about post-op protocol. You know, what suture I use? Do I use drain? And we're going to all talk about everything that I do. Um, so if you have any questions or any recommendations or any, any tidbits for me, I'm more than happy to, to welcome those. So just 65-year-old with pain, swelling, limited motion, you know, blah, pain, 8 to 10. Okay, she's hurting right now. Uh, she comes in radiographically. I mean, she's got every sign of, of arthritis there. Um, this patient can go one of four ways, chylectomy, hemi, total, or fusion. And I will consent her for all four things. And the reason why is just because it looks bad on x-ray doesn't mean that chondral surface is pristine in there. Sometimes these patients are so locked up that the chondral surface looks great is that she just had a, you know, a traumatic flux fracture on the base and it just shut down the top and completely restricted her and the cartilage looks great. So she would benefit from just you know, you know, you can do a decompression osteotomy all day long. I'm not going to go into that, but uh, just doing a simple chylectomy on that and really help her. Now, if she just has a first metatarsal head involvement, then just do a hemi on her. If the base is pristine, and I mean pristine, if there's no chondral deficit, there's no chondral malacia, there's no osteophyte production on any of the four cortices of the of the bone, then then just put your hemi in, and there's nothing wrong with that. And then obviously, if, if you're not comfortable with anything, then just use it. So this patient ended up with a total. Um, you can see that it is perfect position. I didn't do this, by the way, um, but this is a perfect position of an implant, and it looks like it's a one millimeter uh, space for poly. You know, obviously there's no HAV there, um, so you know, and we'll talk about that. So what we've learned, and this is basically what I've learned, and what I've you know learned from doing a lot of these, and and I made mistakes. Don't get me wrong, but you know, we kind of come back swinging harder next time. So good surgical technique is the, is the main one. Um, if you're not comfortable with putting these in, you know, ask somebody. You know, talk to your local rep. Talk to, you know, all the arthrosurface guys are actually really nice people. Um, they can get a surgeon to you. And I've done that for other docs where, you know, somebody in your area that maybe does a lot of them, you know, can help you out and there's nothing wrong with that. I'd rather the 
Tomo should get a good reputation in the community than you know three or four docs putting them in wrong, and then it kind of gets around and nobody wants to do it, or you know the primary care docs don't want to send it to anymore because they know you're going to put that in. So you know, good surgical technique. Everybody's trained well. There is no bad training these days. So there's no reason why you can't put this in. If it's a if it's a fear, then you know there are a lot of labs that are set up um, and webinars, and we can go over all that. So discuss your expectations, real world expectations, uh, informed consent. I mean, this isn't rocket science. I mean, this is nothing more than a backwards knee, upside down knee, and the implant components are very similar to the total ankle, very similar to the total knee. It's just on a micro scale. It's in a little smaller area. So you just got to have the same expectations. So, you know, one of the things I did is I read a lot of literature on total knee replacement and all the possible complications those can have. And I scare the hell out of my patients in the room when they leave the office. You're going, I know if I want to do this, and that that's good. That you know they want to leave. You need to tell them everything, all the good, the bad, the ugly. And if something bad does happen, then you know we we talked about it. We talked about how we're going to rectify it. And so they don't leave and go to the doc down the street, and then he badmouths you and takes it out and fuses it, and then, you know, the world starts over again. Um, this is kind of a new and aggressive soft tissue release. I mean, that's it's very, very important. There's a lot of doctors that I've showed to do this, and especially in a lab where I show them how much release, and they look at me like I just cut the toe off. It is I have never had anything not heal, I've never disrupted any blood supply. Now, one thing you can do wrong would be to bag the, the long flexor, and if you do that, then you either, you better find it and repair it, or just plan on fusing it right then and there, or expect on talking with the lawyer, because if you bag that flanter flexor tendon, the longest it's, it's over, that, that implant's not going to work at all. So if you do your soft tissue release and you release your flexor brevis tendon, and that's something that if you ever want to see what that looks like, the lab's the best way to show you that, um, and they have a lot of labs throughout the year. Uh, but we release the short flexor tendons uh, to get us the motion or the dorsiflexion of that phalanx base. Anybody who has stage 3, 4, limitus or rigidus is locked down. It, those, those tendons have tightened, uh, the ligaments have tightened, and so we need to release all that. Uh, but if you do cut the flexor tendon longest, you need to A, repair it, or B, fuse it, or C, make sure you got a good lawyer. Um, <clears throat> HAV, there's some, I'm not, I'm walking away right now from HAV. I've done a couple, and they just didn't really, I wasn't happy with them. Uh, Arthur Service does have the kiss lock, uh, which is kind of like the tightrope. The tightrope's been out longer, but the kiss lock is far superior because it's got a bigger, Kind of lever arm on the other side, so you're not going to get the stress risers. But I'm not convinced on that, so I won't I won't comment on that. Move early. Um, my protocol is patients are walking postoperatively day of and post-op shoe. They will be in a post-op shoe uh, three to four weeks. At three to four weeks, if the incision heals really well and they don't have a lot of uh, swelling and bleeding, uh, they will go back into a normal tennis shoe at three weeks. I put a drain in everything and every single procedure. Any whether it's a hemi or a total, I'll put the drain in. Um, patients tend to have less pain. Um, it does bleed quite a bit in there, so there's no reason to trap that blood and get swelling or type of infectious risk. Uh, so I do drain these, and it's just this, you know, I use a quarter elastic and put it in, exit lateral to the incision, and patients do really well. Um, and then when in doubt, fuse it. You know, there's nothing wrong with fusion. I'm, I do fuse joints, uh, very few of them these days, but, you know, you can fuse joints. So don't be scared of that. Uh, assess interoption, interop uh, motion. Get to 90 degrees on the table. And if you don't, get to 90 degrees or fuse it. If you can't get to 90 degrees, there's doctors that have done far more than I have, and that's kind of the, you know, that's the, the take home is get to 90 degrees. If you get to 90 degrees, you release the soft tissue up. That flexor apparatus is loose enough as well as the sesamoids are, are articulating and moving. So if you can't get to 90 degrees, you need to decompress your phalanx, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you what that looks like, and um, or do a better release plantarly. Just don't bag the uh, flexor along his tendon. And if you can't get to 90 degrees, then maybe this patient does have too much arthritis of the sesamoids or, or plantar contracture, um, then maybe this is a good fusion candidate. Um, I have left, you know, the table at 75 because I was like, oh, it's 75. It's, it's close enough, and 
and you can definitely tell a difference because they're going to lose about 30 to 40 degrees of that 90 as soon as you, you know, come off the table. It's just like driving a new car out of the lot. I mean, you lost value just driving out of the parking lot. You're going to lose motion just coming off the table. Uh, so definitely assess the inner out motion, get to 90. <clears throat> so this is just, just real quick on these case studies. The last one's a good one. Uh, patient A, uh, sorry. Patient A, um, you can see top left, joints pretty well. You know, almost looks auto fuse there, but it's not. So we open it up, release it. You can see that I've got them, um, uh, the retractors underneath the joint, and, and those are sitting on top of the sesamoid. I use a McLamry elevator. I will, you know, sometimes get all the way up to the tonsils if I have to, uh, to release that. Um, it will eventually stop. So just release all your, you know, take that McLamry elevator, go plantar, then you go lateral, then you go medial, and it sounds like you're, you know, breaking celery or, or you know, crushing a small kid's bone. But um, get in there and release that. And you can see that I've got a release because we've got the retractors above the sesamoids underneath the, the toe. And you can see there's a lot of chondral deficit there. That patient, you can... You can microfracture that all day long. You can do an oats. You can do, you know, the new thing is amio. But, you know, that's nobody's paying for that now. So this patient doesn't need a implant. You can see in the bottom left, there's the hemi on the metatarsal head. Uh, one thing I'll do, I like to do, is I like to remodel that first metatarsal head before I put the implant in, just so I know my my angles and my location where I'm at as far as the wire. And you can see here, there's 90 degrees of push flexion on the bottom right. So. Patient B, another, it's a good example of, you know, not much destruction on the base, but there is destruction on the base. And if you really can't appreciate it, but there's a lot of con, conomalacia and just real thinning of that joint midline, um, and special dorsal medial right there. So historically, that would just be a hemi all day long, and that patient would probably come back in five years, and, and we would take it out and fuse it. So, but the good thing is now you have the modular system, so you can make that call. You can make that judgment call, and I don't think there's a wrong or right with that. Um, and I take pictures of all, everything, so it's not like we, we lied. So, obviously, the first metatarsal head needs to be replaced, and you can definitely look at that proximal phalanx base, and, and that was replaced, and that patient went on did really well. Um, this is patient C. <clears throat> this is a 60, this is probably the top five worst ones I've ever done. And this was actually done this last week. And he's a 62 year old farmer. He's been stepped on by the same cow consistently for the last five years or last 20 years. And he, he swears it's the same cow, which, you know, he's an individual. But uh, you can see that, you know, it's pretty substantial arthritis going on in there. We're just kind of, and it took a while uh, to get that just to open up in that much. And we keep walking down the line. He's got significant dorsal medial, medial. Um, excess ptosis right there, as well as the lateral, um, and you can see that it's pretty much flat. Now, one thing I want you, everybody, to appreciate on the screen: I'm holding this toe at basically at rectus position, and you can see that there's substantial lateral erosion of that proximal phalanx base. Um, so there's a pretty big gap of a uh, chondral and bony loss of that proximal phalanx, and that's going to come important later. So what I like to do, it's not in the it's not in the technique guide, but it's something that works for me. And you know, whatever works for you, you can do. But this is what I do. I remodel that first metatarsal head. I get it close to anatomical, what I think it may have looked like when he was born. That's what I start with. So when I throw my wire, I throw it one time. I don't have to throw it 15 times because I don't know where you know the middle is. I don't know where dorsal planner is. Remodel the head. Get all your exosteosis off. And same thing with the base. I start with the dorsal surface. I usually use a ron drawer. You can use a saw if you're, if you're, you know, comfortable and you don't think you're going to slice the plantar soft tissue. Um, use a ron drawer, dorsal, medial, and lateral. Leave the plantar right away. We'll get to that later. And then you kind of really get a good look at what we're dealing with. Um, so, again, this is a really good picture. It shows that this toe is in a rectus position. You can see there's a huge gap lateral. That lateral phalangeal base, that's how much erosion over time has happened. So <clears throat> one of the biggest mistakes that I see docs do, and you look at post-op x-rays, especially with, with the phalangeal implants they put in over the time, is that they would put it perpendicular to the joint surface. And you can see that that's not the true position of, uh, of the joint, so you need to do perpendicular to the long bone, not the joint surface, or parallel to the long bone, excuse me. 
uh, throw in your wire, and you can see that obviously shoot right from the middle. And I don't use the apparatus, but I, if you've never done it, I would definitely recommend using the uh, cheaters guide that's in there. Um, throwing that wire, you should feel no resistance whatsoever. If you feel resistance, your two planter, uh, which is typically we tend to raise our hand and shoot planter for that cortex. Um, and so make sure you get a really good position and definitely do this. You can do it under live or throw your wire and then look at it. Uh, but you need to do C-arm with this. Um, this is after putting the stem in. I didn't, I didn't want to talk for five hours tonight. So this is with the temporary implant. Uh, this is a 3515. It just worked for him. Uh, I have a lot of uh, bone medial and lateral left there. I tend to get rid of some of that towards the end of it, but I want to make sure I have the real estate to begin with just in case we mess something up and I need to to fuse that. Um, so he's been reamed distally. He's been reamed dorsally. The taper post is in there, and this is a temporary implant right now. Um, same thing with now we're looking at the base, and you can see that I've, I've already cut that, but I've, I've kind of made that base be in a rectus position with perpendicular to the long bone instead of having that lateral erosive surface there. And I did use a saw on this one, and I made sure that the planter soft tissue structures were intact. Um, so one of my tricks of the trade is is throwing your wire perpendicular or parallel to the long bone and you can see that that lateral surface of that phalanx base is completely eroded. Um, so if you go perpendicular to the joint you're going to just pop out right immediately and it's not going to look good. Um, so you, you always want to go parallel to the long bone and you can correct an HAA with this. I mean it's it's a pretty powerful procedure. Uh, putting where you want to put that stem. Um, I line the wire up with the taper post, and that's where my implant will sit. That's where the toe position is going to sit, and you can look under under live frostbite and what that looks like. <clears throat> Looking at the side view, lateral view of the proximal failing space, you want to cheat dorsal. Um, that plantar cortex pops up pretty fast. If you blow out the the uh, dorsal cortex, don't worry. It's you're in solid screw fixation, so it'll heal. Um, you can see the taper post. You can see that the first metatarsal head has the dorsal reaming as well as the distal reaming. Uh, this is the permanent phalangeal insert, uh, so it is almost like a chalice or a cup. Um, it is one solid structure. They do make a temporary uh, spacer in there with a one millimeter, two millimeter uh, that you can try before you put the permanent ones in there. <clears throat> you can see that the, the everything lines up now. There's the x-ray postoperatively. You can see we really swung that toe over. I didn't get the pre-op x-ray. I apologize, but um, you can see that that HAA is, you know, he's not laterally bunted to the second toe anymore, and that's pretty rectus there. There's the implant. Very beautiful seating of that. Um, I don't have a picture, but I do tend to chip away at that bone laterally and medially, and especially dorsally. I don't want it to overgrow that implant anytime soon, so I will be aggressive with that. Um, as long as your stem and your uh, taper post is, is, is solid, that means it's not going to matter whether you have any type of medial lateral surface there. You can see the phalangeal base is, is definitely sunken in. I did remove that kind of dorsal lateral shelf there on that phalangeal base, and you can see that the spacer's in there as well. Another picture. So that's all I got. Questions? 